Thank you.
Welcome, welcome, friends. Welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back to Reading Some Ghost Stories with me, Luke. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to see you all in the chat waiting for the stream to start. Um, let's see what folks saying. Um, <laughs> well, Casey Schoenbaum's right in there saying, don't forget the scarf, Luke. Scarf's on the chair this week. Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. It's fully here. Gentleman Drill says, Hey, Luke, I'm ready for this week's spookening. At least I think I am. How are you? By the way, I ordered MR James's uh, Ghost Stories should arrive tomorrow. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's what we're reading from today. So slight spoiler alert for your uh, book delivery, I suppose. Tom Titherington says, Hi, Luke. I've made myself an accidental streaming station. I'm currently setting up to play some D&D. Thanks for joining me while I do this. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, it's lovely. It's lovely to see you all. Um, yeah, let me know where you're watching from. Um... Yeah, popped on a shirt for this. Why not? Why not? Just trying to class it up, for goodness sake. Um, Shy Violet says, is Fancy Goblet there? Oh, you mean this Fancy Goblet? Mmm, yeah, it is. Mmm. So refreshing. Um, I'm just drinking water, but let's pretend that it's a, a, an, an extremely well-aired red wine, shall we? Why not? Ah, we've got people tuning in from Reddit, from Dublin, Florida, Austria, boring old Bedfordshire, says Matman Hunter. Nothing boring about Bedfordshire. Don't do Bed Bedfordshire down. Winnipeg? Amazing. Just today I watched the episode of The Simpsons where that, uh, that dad driving the car is like, that's it, back to Winnipeg. I love that gag. Okay, well, I could talk about The Simpsons all day, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to read... A ghost story. Oh yes, folks. So if you're new to the stream for the first time, if maybe you just hopped over from the stream that Ellen was just doing, um, here uh, we read a ghost story. Uh, we read um, a different one. We take regular breaks. Not too regular, but we take breaks to talk about how we think the story is going, um, how we think it is, where it, where where things are, where we think things are headed. And well, we are dipping back um, today into... Uh, the incredibly good short story compilation Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M.R. James. We were reading two spooky stories from that last week and we are going to be diving right back in with the last short story in the book. There are several that we haven't read, but this is the last one in the book. It's the longest and it is called The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. And I'm really excited to read this one. I have... Uh, I have read it already, and it's way cool. It's awesome. Um, it's kind of got a treasure hunt vibe. There's, um, well, it's like a sort of British spooky Indiana Jones, but like dial down the adventure a lot and dial up the horror instead. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. Kevin Smith says, everyone on the carpet, it's story time. That's exactly where you should be. Get on that carpet. Ready for story time. Uh, okay, so... I think... If everyone is comfortable... We should... Um, we should crack on. I hope everyone enjoys this. Um, a couple of notes before we begin. One, the beginning to this, the very beginning to the, it. it's got an... It's got an unconventional beginning. You'll see what I mean as soon as I get into it. And two, 
um, there is a, um, there's quite a lot of, like, treasure hunting in this, which means there are, like, codes and mysteries. And it's really, really cool. But um, some of that is arguably easier to understand when you see it on the page than when you are um than when you are reading it aloud i think it'll be fine i think it'll be fine um but uh just um a small well just a small warning for that also there's a a written convention where sometimes um surnames are obscured there's a character in this who's just referred to as lord d and it's a capital d and then dash 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 you sometimes you see that um especially in like older writing that sounds weird, though, so I am going to rename them to Lord Dean after the Bishop of Dean from Les Miserables, because why not? Why not? Uh, okay, so if everyone is sitting comfortably, <clears throat> I will switch into Storyteller mode, and we will have ourselves a real spooky time. Paul Harry says, I'm not comfortable. Begin anyway. That's it. That's the courage. That's the courage that we want. Here we go. <clears throat> The Treasure of Abbot Thomas by M. R. James. Verum usque in presentum diem multigariant inter sur canonica de abscondido codam istius abbatis Thomae tesoro crem sepe quancum ahaduc incasum quis severant steinfeldenses ipsum enum tomum adhuc florida inaete existentem in gentem auri massam circa monasterium defodice perhibent, de quo multoties interrogatus ubi esset, cum risu respondere solitus erat. Job Johannes et Zacharias vel vobis vel posteris indicabunt, idemque aliquando adiacere se inventuris minime invisurum. Inta alia huis abatis opera, hoc memoria praesipue, dignum indico quod fenastrum magnum, in orientali parti alae astralis in ecclesia, sua imaginibus optime in vitro depictis impleverit, id quod et ipsius effigies, et insignia ebedem posita demonstrant, domum quoque Abatialem fere totam restoravit, puteo in atrio ipsius effoso et lapidibus mamores pulcre caelatis exonato, decesit autem morte aliquantulum subitanae perculusis aetitis sua anno inca nociotis vero dominicae. I suppose I shall have to translate this, said the antiquary to himself, as he finished copying the above lines from that rather rare and exceedingly diffuse book, the Certum Stanfildense Norbertinium. Well, it may as well be done first as last, and accordingly the following rendering was very quickly produced. Up to the present day there is much gossip among the canons about a certain hidden treasure of this abbot Thomas, for which those of Steinfeld have often made search, though hitherto in vain. The story is that Thomas, while yet in the vigour of life, concealed a very large quantity of gold somewhere in the monastery. He was often asked where it was, and always answered with a laugh, Job, John, and Zechariah will, will tell either you or your successors. He sometimes added that he should feel no grudge against those who might find it. Among other works carried out by this abbot, I may specially mention his filling the great window at the east end of the south aisle of the church with figures admirably painted on glass, as his effigy and arms in the window attest. He also restored almost the whole of the abbot's lodging and dug a well in the court of it, which he adorned with beautiful carvings in marble. He died rather suddenly in the 72nd year of his age, A.D. 1529. So that's a translation of the Latin. The object which the antiquary had before him at the moment was that of tracing the whereabouts of the painted windows of the Abbey Church at Steinfeld. Shortly after the Revolution, a very large quantity of painted glass made its way from the dissolved abbeys of Germany and Belgium to this country, and may now be seen adorning various of our parish churches, cathedrals, 
and private chapels. Steinfeld Abbey was among the most considerable of these involuntary contributors to our artistic possession. I am quoting the somewhat ponderous preamble of the book which the antiquary wrote. And the greater part of the glass from that institution can be identified without much difficulty by the help either of the numerous inscriptions in which the place is mentioned, or of the subjects of the windows in which several well-defined cycles or narratives were represented. The passage with which I begin my story had set the antiquary on the track of another identification. In a private chapel, no matter where, he had seen three large figures, each occupying a whole light in a window, and evidently the work of one artist. Their style made it plain that the artist had been a German of the 16th century, but hitherto the more exact localising of them had been a puzzle. They represented, wouldn't you be surprised to hear it, Job Patriarcha, Johannes Evangelista, Zacharias Propheta, and each of them held a book or scroll inscribed with a sentence from his writings. These, as a matter of course, the antiquary had noted, and had been struck by the curious way in which they differed from any text of the Vulgate that he had been able to examine. Thus the scroll in Job's hand was inscribed Aro est locus in quo absconditur, there is a place for gold where it is hidden. On the book of John was Habent in vestimentis suis scripturam quam nemo nobit, they have on their raiment a writing which no man knoweth, and Zacharias had super lapidem unum septum oculi sunt, upon one stone are seven eyes. A sad perplexity it had been to our investigator to think why these three personages should have been placed together in one window. There was no bond of connection between them, either historic, symbolic or doctrinal, and he could only suppose that they must have formed part of a very large series of prophets and apostles, which might have filled, say, all the clerestory windows of some capacious church. But the passage from the Certum had altered the situation by showing that the names of the actual personages represented in the glass, now in Lord Dean's chapel, had been constantly on the lips of Abbot Thomas von Esselhausen of Steinfeld, and that this abbot had put up a painted window, probably about the year 1520, in the south aisle of his abbey church. It was no very wild conjecture that the three figures might have formed part of Abbot Thomas's offering. It was one which, moreover, could probably be confirmed or set aside by another careful examination of the glass. And, as Mr Summerton was a man of leisure, he set out on a pilgrimage to the private chapel with very little delay. His conjecture was confirmed to the full. Not only did the style and technique of the glass suit perfectly with the date and place required, but in another window of the chapel he found some glass, known to have been brought along with the figures, which contained the arms of Abbot Thomas von Essenhausen. At intervals during his researches, Mr Summerton had been haunted by the recollection of the gossip about the hidden treasure, and as he thought the matter over, it became more and more obvious to him that if the abbot meant anything by the enigmatical answer which he gave to his questioners, he must have meant that the secret was to be found somewhere in the window he had placed in the abbey church. It was undeniable, furthermore, that the first of the curiously selected texts on the scroll in the window might be taken to have a reference to hidden treasure. Every feature, therefore, or mark which could possibly assist in elucidating the riddle which he felt sure the abbot had set to posterity, he noted with scrupulous care, and, returning to his Berkshire manor house, consumed many a pint of the midnight oil over his tracings and sketches. After two or three weeks, a day came when Mr Summerton announced to his man that he must pack his own and his master's things for a short journey abroad, whither for the moment we will not follow him. And that is the end of part one. So, I mentioned a weird opening. Quite a lot of Latin right at the beginning, and I think that that is a... I'm not going to sh- I think that's a tough beginning. I think that's- a knowing this whole story, I think that's a tough beginning. Um, I think what we basically need to know at this point is that this mysterious Abbot Thomas of the past, um, buried some treasure. And this Mr. Summerton 
is trying to find it and he believes that these paintings are a clue. Beth Bloomer says, did you practice the Latin, Luke? No, I didn't. I probably should have. Um, I was just winging it uh, and trying to remember the little bit of Latin that I did in school. Um, uh, which basically, I think, involves just trying to get every letter in there. Um, oh, there you go. Jano117 says, sets the atmosphere quite right, which is good to know. And... Um, Mr. Team Corvette. Hello, Dan says the Latin bit was a fantastic opener. Was slightly worried we were being cursed at that point, though. I mean, look, I can't translate that Latin. We did get a translation, but I can't promise that. Um, I can't promise you weren't cursed. Aunt Sweeney says that was some nice winging, Luke. Nice winging. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, a huge part of my job is basically reading things that I've not necessarily seen before many times if i have to read a script that one of the someone else from outside xbox or outside extra has written um you know an entry in a list or something that i haven't seen before so i've had a lot of practice at winging it but thank you uh shauna goddard says is that blood in your goblet yes yes okay so we're on the hunt of some treasure. Shall we progress? Mr. Gregory, the rector of Parsbury, had strolled out before breakfast, it being a fine autumn morning, as far as the gate of his carriage drive, with intent to meet the postman and sniff the cool air. Nor was he disappointed of either purpose. Before he had had time to answer more than ten or eleven of the miscellaneous questions propounded to him in the lightness of their hearts by his young offspring, who had accompanied him, the postman was seen approaching, and among the morning's budget was one letter bearing a foreign postmark and stamp, which became at once the object of an eager competition among the youthful Gregories, and addressed in an uneducated but plainly an English hand. When the rector opened it and turned to the signature, he realised that it came from the confidential valet of his friend and squire, Mr. Summerton. Thus it ran. Honoured sir, as I am in great anxiety about master, I write as is wish to beg you, sir, if you could be so good as step over. Master has had a nasty shock and keeps his bed. I never have known him like this, but no wonder, and nothing will serve but you, sir. Master says I would mention the short way here is drive to Koblintz and take a trap. Hoping I've made all plain, but I'm much confused in myself, what with anxiety and weakfulness at night. If I might be so bold, sir, it will be a pleasure to see an honest British face among all these foreign ones. I am, sir, your obedient servant, William Brown. P.S. The village for town, I will not turn it. Sorry, the village for town, the village for town, I will not turn it, is named Steenfeld. The reader must be left to picture to himself in detail the surprise, confusion and hurry of preparation into which the receipt of such a letter would likely plunge a quiet Berkshire parsonage in the year of grace 1859. It is enough for me to say that a train to, tra a train to town was caught in the course of the day and that Mr Gregory was able to secure a cabin in the Antwerp boat and a place in the Koblenz train. Nor was it difficult to manage the transit from that centre to Steinfeld. I labour under a grave disadvantage as narrator of this story in that I have never visited Steinfeld myself and that neither of the principal actors in the episode, from whom I derive my information, was able to give me anything but a vague and rather dismal idea of its appearance. I gather that it is a small place, with a large church despoiled of its ancient fittings, a number of rather ruinous great buildings, mostly of the 17th century, surround this church. For the abbey, in common with most of those on the continent, was rebuilt in a luxurious fashion by its inhabitants at that period. It has not seemed to me worthwhile to lavish money on a visit to the place, for though it is probably far more attractive than either Mr. Summerton or Mr. Gregory thought it, there is evidently little, if anything, of first-rate interest to be seen, except perhaps one thing which I should not care to see. 
The inn where the English gentleman and his servant were lodged is, or was, the only possible one in the village. Mr. Gregory was taken to it at once by his driver, and found Mr. Brown waiting at the door. Mr. Brown, a model when in his Berkshire home of the impassive, whiskered race who are known as confidential valets, was now egregiously out of his element, in a light tweed suit, anxious, almost irritable, and plainly anything but master of the situation. His relief at the sight of the honest British face of his rector was unmeasured, but words to describe it were denied him. He could only say, "'Well, I am pleased, I'm sure, sir, to see you, and so I'm sure, sir, will master.' "'How is your Master Brown?' Mr. Gregory, Le Mr. Gregory eagerly put in. "'I think he's better, sir, thank you, but he's had a dreadful time of it. "'I hope he's getting some sleep now, but what has been the matter? I, "'I couldn't make out from your letter. Was it an accident of any kind?' "'Well, sir, I hardly know whether I'd better speak about it. "'Master was very particular he should be the one to tell you. "'But there's no bones broke. That's one thing I'm sure we ought to be thankful of. "'What does the doctor say?' asked Mr. Gregory. They were by this time outside Mr. Somerton's bedroom door, and speaking in low tones. Mr. Gregory, who happened to be in front, was feeling for the handle, and chanced to run his fingers over the panels. Before Mr. Brown could answer, there was a terrible cry from within the room. "'In God's name, who is that?' were the first words they heard. "'Brown, is it?' "'Yes, sir, me, sir, and Mr. Gregory.' Brown hastened to answer, and there was an audible groan of relief in reply. They entered the room, which was darkened against the afternoon sun, and Mr. Gregory saw, with a shock of pity, how drawn, how damp with drops of fear was the usually calm face of his friend, who, sitting up in the curtained bed, stretched out a shaking hand to welcome him. "'Better for seeing you, my dear Gregory,' was the reply to the rector's first question, and it was palpably true." After five minutes of conversation, Mr. Somerton was more his own man, Brown afterwards reported, than he had been for days. He was able to eat a more than respectable dinner, and talked confidentially of being fit to stand a journey to Koblenz within twenty-four hours. "'But there's one thing,' he said, with a return of agitation which Mr. Gregory did not like to see, "'which I must beg you to do for me, my dear Gregory. Don't,' he went." on laying his hand on Gregory's to forestall any interruption. Don't ask me what it is or why I want it done. I'm not up to explaining it yet. It would, it would throw me back, undo all the good you have done me by coming. The only word I will say about it is that you run no risk whatever by doing it, and that Brown can and will show you tomorrow what it is. It's merely to put back, to keep something. No, I, I can't speak of it yet. Do you mind calling Brown? "'Well, Somerton,' said Mr. Gregory as he crossed the room to the door, "'I won't ask for any explanations till you see fit to give them. "'And if this bit of business is as easy as you represent it to be, "'I will very gladly undertake it for you first thing in the morning.' "'I was sure you would, my dear Gregory. "'I was certain I could rely on you. "'I shall owe you more thanks than I can tell. Uh, "'Now here is Brown. "'Brown, one word with you.' "'Shall I go?' interjected Mr. Gregory. "'Not at all, Timmy, no. "'Brown.' The first thing tomorrow morning, you don't mind early hours, I know, Gregory, you must take the rector to... There, you know. A nod from Brown, who looked grave and anxious. And he and you will put, will put that back. You needn't be in the least alarmed. It's perfectly safe in the daytime. You know what I mean. It lies on the step. You know where... where we put it. Brown swallowed, dryly, once or twice, and failing to speak, bowed. And, yes, that's all. Only this one other word, my dear Gregory. If you can manage to keep from questioning Brown about this matter, I shall be still more bound to you. Tomorrow evening, at latest, if all goes well, I shall be able, I believe, to tell you the whole story from start to finish. And now I'll wish you good night. Brown will be with me. He sleeps here. And if I were you, I should lock my door. Yes, be particular to do that. They, um... They like it, the people here, and it's better. Good night, good night. They parted upon this, and if Mr. Gregory woke once or twice in the small hours and fancied he heard a fumbling about the lower part of his locked door, it was perhaps no more than what a quiet man suddenly plunged into a strange bed and the heart of a mystery might reasonably expect. 
Certainly, he thought, to the end of his days, that he had heard such a sound twice or three times between midnight and dawn. He was up with the sun and out in company with Brown soon after. Perplexing as was the service he had been asked to perform for Mr. Summerton, it was not a difficult or an alarming one, and within half an hour from his leaving the inn it was over. What it was I shall not as yet divulge. Later in the morning Mr. Summerton, now almost himself again, was able to make a start from Steinfeld, and that same evening, whether at Coblentz or at some intermediate stage on the journey, I am not certain, he settled down to the promised explanation. Brown was present, but how much of the matter was ever really made plain to his comprehension he would never say, and I am unable to conjecture. And that is the end of part two. Kobe Morris says, there, put that back, getting some bad vibes. Yeah, right. What did that involve? Hmm. Danny McNamara says, what a xenophobe. Yeah, that's a fair comment. Um, we didn't do the disclaimer at the top of the stream, but as usual with these uh, um, old stories, as we've said before, the real horror are Victorian attitudes to uh, women, colonialism, class, race, nationality, sexuality. Take your pick. Um, yeah, there's a, there was a line in there about... Um, uh, what a relief to see an honest British face, which is, you know, the kind of the kind of thing um, that you that you do sometimes get in these old stories. Nimble Tax says building the tension nicely. Yeah, what I like about um, what I like about M R James, and this has happened a few times in other stories, is um, uh, I quite like the way that the narrative sort of jumps around. It doesn't tend to be too much, but there's something I like the way it sort of seeds tension by you're introduced to a character they go off and do something and it and the author says i'm not going to tell you what happened i'll tell you later and then you come back as we have now after something horrifying has clearly happened because um obviously mr summerton on his treasure hunting expedition um got spooked real bad real bad Fran Fry says, shout out to my brother who's visiting and is sitting here with me. Hi, Fran Fry and the brother. Thank you both for watching. Jimmy Snow B says, Luke, your voice makes the story all the more scarier. Well done. Thank you. That is, um, um, that is flattering and kind. Thank you. Web Giant says, can I get a shout out for my wife, Michelle, who's writing a graduate school paper and will be watching later telling her reading telling her reading can be fun michelle reading can be fun <laughs> although i'm reading a short ghost story and you are writing a graduate school paper that sounds really intense good work with it um good luck with it even um but yes shout out michelle blank says still no sign of organs or spiders well it's early days yet So, should we crack on? I want to know what happened to Mr. Summerton. Let me just check that everything is okay with my stream. Let me know, folks, by the way, if the audio levels on this are okay. Uh, I'm not monitoring them because um, I didn't want to wear headphones. I feel like it kills the vibe. But, um, yeah, let me know if you can hear everything all right. Got a crackling fire sound going. Um, let me know if that's coming through. <clears throat> okay, so I think we're ready to move to part three. This was Mr. Summerton's story. You know roughly, both of you, that this expedition of mine was undertaken with the object of tracing something in connection with some old painted glass in Lord Dean's private chapel. Well, the starting point of the whole matter lies in this passage from an old printed book, to which I will ask your attention. At this point, Mr. Summerton went carefully over some ground with which we are already familiar. On my second visit to the chapel, 
he went on. My purpose was to take every note I could of figures, lettering, diamond scratchings on the glass, and even apparently accidental markings. The first point which I tackled was that of the inscribed scrolls. I could not doubt that the first of these, that of Job, there is a place for the gold where it is hidden, with its intentional alteration, must refer to the treasure. So I applied myself with some confidence to the next, that of St. John. They have on their vestures a writing which no man knoweth. The natural question will have occurred to you, was there an inscription on the robes of the figures? I could see none. Each of the three had a broad black border to his mantle, which made a conspicuous and rather ugly feature in the window. I was nonplussed, I will own, and, but for a curious bit of luck, I think I should have left the search where the canons of Steinfeld had left it before me. But it so happened that there was a good deal of dust on the surface of the glass, and Lord Dean, happening to come in, noticed my blackened hands and kindly insisted on sending for a Turk's head broom to clean down the window. There must, I suppose, have been a rough piece in the broom. Anyhow, as it passed over the border of one of the mantles, I noticed that it left a long scratch, and that some yellow stain instantly showed up. I asked the man to stop his work for a moment, and ran up the ladder to examine the place. The yellow stain was there, sure enough, and what had come away was a thick black pigment, which had evidently been laid on with the brush after the glass had been burnt and could therefore be easily scraped off without doing any harm. I scraped accordingly, and you will hardly believe me. No, I, I do you an injustice. You will have guessed already. I found under this black pigment two or three clearly formed capital letters in yellow stain on a clear ground. Of course I could hardly contain my delight. I told Lord Dean that I had detected an inscription which I thought might be very interesting, and begged to be allowed to uncover the whole of it. He made no difficulty about it whatever, told me to do exactly as I pleased, and then, having an engagement, was obliged, rather to my relief, I must say, to leave me. I set to work at once and found the task a fairly easy one. The pigment, disintegrated, of course, by time, came off almost at a touch, and I don't think that it took me a couple of hours, all told, to clean the whole of the black borders in all three lights. Each of the figures had, as the inscription said, a writing on their vestures, which nobody knew. This discovery, of course, made it absolutely certain to my mind that I was on the right track. And now, what was the inscription? While I was cleaning the glass, I almost took pains not to read the lettering, saving up the treat until I got the whole thing clear. And when that was done, my dear Gregory, I assure you, I could almost have cried from sheer disappointment. What I read was only the most hopeless jumble of letters that was ever shaken up in a hat. Here it is. For Job, D-R-E-V-I-C-I-O-P-E-D-M-O-O-F-M-S-M-V-I-V-L-I-S-L-C-A-V-I-B-A-S-B-A-T-A-O-V-T. For St. John, R-D-I-I-E-A-M-R-L-E-S-I-P-V-S-P-O-D. S-E-E-I-R-S-E-T-T-A-A-E-S-G-I-A-V-N-N-R. -E -E and there is one for Zachariah. F-T-E-E-A-I-L-N-Q-D-P-V-A-V-M-T-L-E-E-A-T-T-O-H-I-O-O-N-V-M-C-A-A-T-H-Q-E. Blank as I felt and must have looked for the first few minutes... My disappointment didn't last long. I realised almost at once that I was dealing with a cipher or cryptogram, and I reflected that it was likely to be of a pretty simple kind, considering its early date. So, I copied the letters with the most anxious care. Another little point I may tell you turned up in the process which confirmed my belief in the cipher. After copying the letters on Job's robe, I counted them to make sure that I had them right. There were 38, and just as I finished going through them, my eye fell on a scratching made with a sharp point on the edge of the border. It was simply the number 38 in Roman numerals. To cut the matter short, there was a similar note, as I may call it, in each of the other lights, and that made it plain to me that the glass painter had very strict orders from Abbot Thomas about the inscription and had taken pains to get it correct. Well, after that discovery, you may imagine how minutely I went over the whole surface of the glass in search of further light. 
Of course, I did not neglect the inscription on the scroll of Zechariah, Upon one stone are seven eyes, but I very quickly concluded that this must refer to some mark on a stone which could only be found in situ where the treasure was concealed. To be short, I made all possible notes and sketches and tracings, and then came back to Parsbury to work out the cipher at leisure. The agonies I went through! I thought myself very clever at first, for I made sure that the key would be found in some of the old books of secret writing. The Stenographia of Joachim Trathimius, who was an early contemporary of Abbot Thomas, seemed particularly promising, so I got that and Selenius's Cryptographia, and Bacon's De Augmentis Seantarum, and some more. But I could hit upon nothing. Then I tried the principle of the most frequent letter, taking first Latin and then German as a basis. Well, that didn't help either. Whether it ought to have done so, I am not clear. And then I came back to the window myself, and read over my notes, hoping almost against hope that the abbot might himself have somewhere supplied the key I wanted. I could make nothing out of the colour or pattern of the robes, there were no landscape backgrounds with subsidiary objects, there was nothing in the canopies. The only resource possible seemed to be in the attitudes of the figures. Job, I read, scroll in left hand, forefinger of right hand extended upwards. John holds inscribed book in left hand with right hand blesses with two fingers. Zachariah, scroll in left hand, right hand extended upwards, as Job, but with three fingers pointed up. In other words, I reflected, Job has one finger extended, John has two, Zachariah has three. May not there be a numerical key concealed in that? My dear Gregory, said Mr. Somerton, laying his hand on his friend's knee, that was the key. I didn't get it to fit at first, but after two or three trials, I saw what was meant. After the first letter of the inscription, you skip one letter. After the next, you skip two, and after that, skip three. Now look at the result I've got. I've underlined the letters which form words. Do you see it? Decem milia auri reposita sunt in puteo in at. Ten thousand pieces of gold are laid up in a well in, followed by an incomplete word beginning at. So far, so good. I tried the same plan with the remaining letters, but it wouldn't work. And I fancied that perhaps the placing of dots after the three last letters might indicate some difference of procedure. Then I thought to myself, wasn't there some allusion to a well in the account of Abbot Thomas in that book, The Certum? Yes, there was. He built a puteus in atrio, a well in the court. There, of course, was my word atrio. At rio, atrio. The next step was to copy out the remaining letters on the inscription, omitting those I had already used. That gave you what you will see on this slip. Now, I, uh, I knew what the first three letters I wanted were, namely rio, R-I-O, to complete the word atrio, and, as you will see, these are all to be found in the first five letters. I was a little confused at first by the occurrence of two I's, but very soon I saw that every alternate letter must be taken in the remainder of the inscription. You can work it out for yourself, the result continuing where the first round left off. Thus, Rio Domus, Abatialis, de Steinfeld Ami, Toma, qui possui custodem super ea, gare a qui la touche. So the whole secret was out. Ten thousand pieces of gold are laid up in the well in the court of the abbot's house of Steinfeld by me, Thomas, who have set a guardian over them. Gare a qui la louche. The last words I ought to say are a device which Abbot Thomas had adopted. I found it with his arms in another piece of glass at Lord Dean's, and he drafted it bodily into his cipher, though it doesn't quite fit in point of grammar. Well, what would any human being have been tempted to do, my dear Gregory, in my place? Could he have helped setting off, as I did, to Steinfeld, and tracing the secret literally to the fountainhead? I don't believe he could. Anyhow, I couldn't. And, as I needn't tell you, I found myself at Steinfeld as soon as the resources of civilization could put me there, and installed myself in the inn you saw. I must tell you that I was not altogether free from forebodings, on one hand of disappointment, on the other of danger. 
There was always the possibility that Abbot Thomas's well might have been wholly obliterated, or else that someone, ignorant of cryptograms and guided only by luck, might have stumbled on the treasure before me. And then there was a very perceptible shaking of the voice here. I was not entirely easy, I need not mind confessing, as to the meaning of the words about the guardian of the treasure. But if you don't mind, I'll say no more about that until... until it becomes necessary. At the first possible opportunity, Brown and I began exploring the place. I had naturally represented myself as being interested in the remains of the abbey, and we could not avoid paying a visit to the church, impatient as I was to be elsewhere. Still, it did interest me to see the window where the glass had been, and especially that at the east end of the south aisle. In the tracery lights of that, I was startled to see some fragments and coats of arms remaining. Abbot Thomas's shield was there, and a small figure with a scroll inscribed Oculos habent et non videbunt. They have eyes and shall not see. Which, I take it, was a hit at the abbot a hit of the abbot at his cannons. But, of course, the principal object was to find the abbot's house. There is no prescribed place for this, so, as far as I know, in the plan of a monastery, you can't predict of it, as you can in the chapter house, that it will be on the eastern side of the cloister, or, as, the, as of the dormitory, that it will communicate with a transept of the church. I felt that if I asked many questions, I might awake lingering memories of the treasure, and I thought it best to try first to discover it for myself. It was not a very long or difficult search. That three-sided court southeast of the church, with deserted piles of buildings round it, and grass-grown pavement which you saw this morning, was the place. And glad enough I was to see that it was put to no use, and was neither very far from our inn, nor overlooked by any inhabited building. There were only orchards and paddocks on the slopes east of the church. I can tell you that fine stone glowed wonderfully in the rather watery yellow sunset that we had on the Tuesday afternoon. Next, what about the well? There was not much doubt about that, as you can testify. It is really a very remarkable thing. The curb is, I think, of Italian marble, and the carving, I thought, must be Italian also. There were reliefs, you will perhaps remember, of Eliza and Rebecca and of Jacob opening the well for Rachel, and similar subjects. But by way of disarming suspicion, I suppose, the abbot had carefully abstained from any of his cynical and elusive inscriptions. I examined the whole structure with the keenest interest. Of course, a square wellhead with an opening in one side, an arch over it, with a wheel for the rope to pass over, evidently in very good condition still, for it had been used within sixty years, or perhaps even later, though not quite recently. Then there was the question of depth and access to the interior. I suppose the depth was about sixty to seventy feet, and as to the other point, it really seemed as if the abbot had wished to lead searchers up to the very door of his treasure house. For, as you tested for yourself, there were big blocks of stone bonded into the masonry, and leading down in a regular staircase, round and round the inside of the well. It seemed almost too good to be true. I wondered if there was a trap, if the stones were so contrived as to tip over when a weight was placed on them but I tried a good many with my own weight and with my stick, and all seemed, and actually were, perfectly firm. Of course I resolved that Brown and I would make an experiment that very night. Let's take a break there. Nimbletack says, Dread rising. Kerima says, The stone has seven eyes. They have eyes but cannot see. Sounds like blind spider priests to me. Not everything is... Not everything has to be spiders. Hmm. Canned laughter says, it's always a trap. Yeah. I, um... Yeah. The, uh, the treasure hunting section that we've just been through is interesting. Because I like that there's a cipher. It's kind of like, you know, kind of Da Vinci Code vibes. But, well... Well, uh, not quite the Da Vinci Code vibes, but opera, you know, playing in that space, um, and I, you know, I like that stuff. I like the kind of treasure hunting. I like the sort of putting it together. The like, I, when I was reading this, I had a very vivid 
um, mental picture of these three stained glass um, paintings. Um, I love the idea of Abbot Thomas, who presumably lived a long time ago, like spending all this time and all this effort, like putting putting this like treasure hunt together. Abbot Thomas, didn't you have other things to be doing? Abbot business? Dally Daydream says, not everything has to be spiders, sure. It just always is. John Burnham says, did Luke just compare James to Dan Brown? Well, look, they're, uh, they're doing a scavenger treasure hunt in an old church, so... Yes. Shy Violet says, they didn't have much to do back then, Luke. All right. Yeah, fair enough. Abbot Thomas could have been starving for hobbies. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know what life expectancy was back then. I, I, I just feel like I... Before Abbot Thomas inevitably is killed by a splinter or a disease that is neither named nor understood, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would be spending all my time making an, an intricate... Um, treasure hunt that you will die before you see completed oh, there you go I guess that's why I um, I guess that's why I uh, never made it as an abbot just me desi13 says honestly abbot thomas was just living his best life alright yeah fair enough hey you're an abbot let's um yeah Let's be, let's hide the gold. Let's build a well that has steps going down the inside. Hmm. Right, chick says he's just vibing with his cursed gold. Yeah. Leave Abbot Thomas alone. Me, the only person who criticised him. Right, should we crack on? Who wants to know what's going on in this well? I'm not sure I do. But... But we're in it now. What can we do? I resolved that Brown and I would make an experiment that very night. I was well prepared. Knowing the sort of place I should have to explore, I had bought a sufficiency of good rope and bands of webbing to surround my body, and crossbars to hold to, as well as lanterns and candles and crowbars, all of which would go into a single carpet bag and excite no suspicion. I satisfied myself that my rope would be long enough and that the wheel for the bucket was in good working order, and then we went home to dinner. I had a little cautious conversation with the landlord, and made out that he would not be over much surprised if I went out for a stroll with my man about nine o'clock to make, heaven forgive me, a sketch of the abbey by moonlight. I asked no questions about the well, and I'm not likely to do so now. I fancy I know as much about it as anyone in Steinfeld, at least with a strong shudder. I don't want to know any more. Now we come to the crisis. And though I hate to think of it, I feel sure, Gregory, that it will be better for me in all ways to recall it just as it happened. We started, Brown and I, at about nine with our bag, and attracted no attention, for we managed to slip out at the hinder end of the inn-yard into an abbey which brought us quite to the edge of the village. In five minutes we were at the well, and for some little time we sat on the edge of the wellhead to make sure that no one was stirring or spying on us. All we heard was some horses cropping grass out of sight farther down the eastern slope. We were perfectly unobserved, and had plenty of light from the gorgeous full moon to allow us to get the rope properly fitted over the wheel. Then I secured the band round my body beneath the arms. We attached the end of the rope very securely to a ring in the stonework. Brown took the lighted lantern and followed me. I had a crowbar. And so we began to descend cautiously, feeling every step before we set foot on it, 
and scanning the walls in search of any marked stone. Half aloud I counted the steps as we went down, and we got as far as the thirty-eighth before I noted anything at all irregular in the surface of the masonry. Even here there was no mark, and I began to feel very blank and to wonder if the abbot's cryptogram could possibly be an elaborate hoax. At the forty-ninth step the staircase ceased. It was with a very sinking heart that I began retracing my steps, and when I was back on the thirty-eighth, Brown, with the lantern being a step or two above me, I scrutinised the little bit of irregularity in the stonework with all my might, but there was no vestige of a mark. Then it struck me that the texture of the surface looked just a little different than the rest, or at least in some way different. It might possibly be cement and not stone. I gave it a good blow with my iron bar. There was a decidedly hollow sound, though that might be the result of our being in a well. But there was more. A great flake of cement dropped to my feet, and I saw marks on the stone underneath. I had tracked the abbot down, my dear Gregory. Even now I think of it with a certain pride. It took but a few few more taps to clear the whole of the cement away, and I saw a slab of stone about two feet square, upon which was engraven a cross. Disappointment again, but only for a moment. It was you, Brown, who reassured me by a casual remark. You said, if I remember right, it's a funny cross, looks like a lot of eyes. I snatched the lantern out of your hand and saw with inexpressible pleasure that the cross was composed of seven eyes. Four in a vertical line, three horizontal. The last of the scrolls in the window was explained in the way I had anticipated. Here was my stone with seven eyes. So far the abbot's data had been exact, and as I thought of this, the anxiety about the guardian returned upon me with increased force. Still, I wasn't going to retreat now. Without giving myself time to think, I knocked away the cement all round the marked stone, and then gave it a prize on the right side with my crowbar. It moved at once, and I saw that it was but a thin, light slab, such as I could easily lift out myself, and that it stopped the entrance to a cavity. I did lift it out unbroken, and set it on the step, for it might be very important to us to be able to replace it. Then I waited for several minutes on the step just above. I don't know why. I think just to see if any dreadful thing would rush out. Nothing happened. Next I lit a, next I lit a candle and very cautiously I placed it inside the cavity with some idea of seeing whether there were foul air and of getting a glimpse of what was inside. There was some foulness of air which nearly extinguished the flame, but in no long time it burned quite steadily. The hole went some little way back, and also on the right and left of the entrance. And I could see some rounded light-coloured objects within, which might be bags. There was no use in waiting. I faced the cavity and looked in. There was nothing immediately in front of the hole. I put my arm in and felt to the right, very gingerly. Just give me a glass of cognac brown. I'll go on in a moment. Gregory. Well, I felt to the right and my fingers touched something curved that felt, yes, more or less like leather. Dampish it was, and evidently part of a heavy, full thing. There was nothing, I must say, to alarm one. I grew bolder, and putting both hands in as well as I could, I pulled it to me, and it came. It was heavy, but moved more easily than I had expected. As I pulled it towards the entrance, my left elbow knocked over and extinguished the candle. I got the thing fairly in front of the mouth and began drawing it out. Just then, Brown gave a sharp ejaculation and ran quickly up the steps with the lantern. He will tell you why in a moment. 
Startled as I was, I looked round after him, and saw him stand for a minute at the top, and then walk away a few yards. Then I heard him call softly, All right, sir, and went on pulling out the great bag in complete darkness. It hung for an instant on the edge of the hole, then slipped forward onto my chest and put its arm ra arms round my neck. My dear Gregory, I am telling you the exact truth. I believe I am now acquainted with the extremity of terror and repulsion which a man can endure without losing his mind. I can only just manage to tell you now the bare outline of the experience. I was conscious of a most horrible smell of mould, and of a cold kind of face pressed against my own and moving slowly over it, and of several, I don't know how many, legs or arms or tentacles or something clinging to my body. I screamed out, Brown says, like a beast, and fell away backwards from the step on which I stood, and the creature slipped downwards, I suppose, onto that same step. Providentially, the band round me held firm. Brown did not lose his head and was strong enough to pull me up to the top and get me over the edge quite promptly. How he managed it exactly, I don't know, and I think he would find it hard to tell you. I believe he contrived to hide our implements in the deserted building nearby, and with very great difficulty he got me back to the inn. I was in no state to make explanations, and Brown knows no German, but next morning I told the people some tale of having had a bad fall in the abbey ruins, which I suppose they believed. And now, before I go further, I should just like you to hear what Brown's experiences during those few minutes were. Tell the rector Brown what you told me. Well, sir, said Brown, speaking low and nervously, it was just this way. Master was busy down in front of the hole, and I was holding the lantern and looking on, when I heard something drop in the water from the top, as I thought, so I looked up, and I see someone's head looking over at us. I suppose I must have said something, and I held the light up and ran up the steps, and my light shone right on the face. That was a bad and so, if ever I see one. An oldish man, and the face very much fell in and laughing, as I thought. And I got up the step as quick, pretty nigh as I'm telling you, and when I was out on the ground there wasn't a sign of any person. There hadn't been the time for anyone to get away, let alone a, an old chap. And I made sure he wasn't crouching down by the well or anything. Next thing I hear Master cry out something horrible. And all I see was him hanging out by the rope. And as Master says, however I got him up, I, I couldn't tell you. You hear that, Gregory, said Mr. Summerton. Now, does any explanation of that incident strike you? The whole thing is so ghastly and abnormal that I must own it puts me quite off my balance. But the thought did occur to me that possibly the, well, the person who set the trap might have come to see the success of his plan. Just so, Gregory, just so. I can think of nothing else so likely, I should say, if such a word has a place anywhere in my story. I think it must have been the abbot. Well, I haven't much more to tell you. I spent a miserable night, Brown sitting up with me. Next day I was no better, unable to get up, no doctor to be had, and if one had been available, I doubt if he could have done much for me. I made Brown write off to you and spent a second terrible night. And Gregory, of this I am sure, and I think it affected me more than the first shock, for it lasted longer. There was someone or something on the watch outside my door the whole night. I almost fancy there were two. It wasn't only the faint noises I heard from time to time all through the dark hours, but there was the smell, the hideous smell of mould. Every rag I had on me, that first evening I had stripped off and made Brown take it away. I believe he stuffed the things into the stove in his room. And yet the smell was there, as intense as it had been in the well. And what is more, it came from outside the door. But with the first glimmer of dawn it faded out and the sound ceased too, and that convinced me that the thing, or things, were creatures of darkness and could not stand the daylight. And so I was sure that if anyone could put back the stone, it or they would be powerless until someone else took it away again. I had to wait until you came to get that done. Of course, I couldn't send Brown to do it by himself, and still less could I tell anyone who belonged to the place. Well, there is my story, and if you don't believe it, I can't help it. But I think you do. Indeed, said Mr. Gregory. 
I can find no alternative. I must believe it. I saw the well and the stone myself, and had a glimpse, I thought, of the bags or something else in the hole. And to be plain with you, Summerton, I believe my door was watched last night too. I dare say it was, Gregory, but thank goodness that is over. Have you, by the way, anything to tell about your visit to that dreadful place? Very little, was the answer. Brown and I managed easily enough to get the slab into its place, and he fixed it very firmly with the irons and wedges you had desired him to get, and we contrived to smear the surface with mud so that it looked just like the rest of the wall. One thing I did notice in the carving on the wellhead, which I think must have escaped you, it was a horrid, grotesque shape, perhaps more like a toad than anything else, and there was a label by it inscribed with the two words, Depositum Custody. Keep that which is committed to thee. And that's the end. And that is the end. Katie Douglas says, Zombie, Ad Zombie Abbott confirmed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Kelsey Shambam says, Abbott Thomas, lol, you fell for my treasure hunt. Yeah. And Antzonk says, the real treasure was the demons we met along the way. Freeside Hellion says, no, 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 I hate anything having to do with mould. Yeah, the detail of the... the, the smell uh i found pretty creepy um yeah what did we think of that story folks let me get your feelings zombie abbot spider zombie spider abbot with a frog guide yep Angela Sanchez says, These stories always end with these dang horrors being released into the world. Yep. Wow, Miss Wendler says, So what I'm getting from this is that there's still a treasure down there, and if you get it during daylight hours, you're fine. Yeah, I suppose so, but... Uh... What about when... What about when night falls? Then you're in trouble. Amory says, that was excellent. Almost a very modern horror feel. Uh, Nimbletack says, it was the way the dead weight of the bag or whatever put its arms around his neck. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a good bit, isn't it? Um, let me just find those words again. Then I heard him call softly, all right, sir, and went on pulling out the great bag in complete darkness. It hung for an instant on the edge of the hole, then slipped forward onto my chest and put its arms round my neck. Ooh, scary. Katie Douglas says, I enjoyed it. The treasure hunt was fun. Uh, Just Me Desi 13 says, I low-key wish there was a bit more. It was real spoopy, though. Eight out of ten. Yeah, I know what you mean. These stories tend to... Well, I think I think some of these... Um, I think some of these older stories kind of defy your expectations of horror in the way that they often end without everyone dying. Uh, like, especially these M.R. James ones, they tend to end, you know, with everybody still breathing. Um, and, every, you know, and, every, and normally not even, like, permanently haunted. They're like, well, gosh, that was a nasty brush with the supernatural. Off we go. Freeside Hellion says, when it was described as feeling like leather. Oh. Ah, Whale Puck says, even during the day, it's dark in the well. That's true. That's true. That's true. Hmm. Yeah. Pretty creepy. Laura Dealey says, liked it, liked it very much. Especially creepy in the middle, uh, especially creepy when uh, in the well in the middle of the night. A little too much Latin? Think my mind exploded a bit. Yeah. Quite a lot of Latin in that one, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Rebecca M. This is a good point that I didn't think about. I just feel really, really sorry for the valet, Brown. He was dealing with all this creepy stuff his master wanted to, but he didn't make that choice. Yeah. I think Brown is the real hero there. He just sort of, you know, rocks up. I mean, he's a, 
He's employed as a valet, not employed as a hold the rope while the master goes into a cursed well. Uh. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't have to do that. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I like the ambiguity. I like, um... I like how spare the description of the actual horror thing is. Should we, should we read that again? A most horrible smell of mould and of a kind of a cold kind of face pressed against my own and moving slowly over it and of several, I don't know how many, legs or arms or tentacles or something clinging to my body. And that's all you get. That's all you get in this reasonably long story. Just... Just a few, few, uh, just a few lines. Very spare. Gentleman Drill says that was some top-notch reading again, as always. Best way to end the week. The well part sure was the creepiest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. Um. Well. Yeah, that was rad. Um, I think probably we will cap it there. But. I would like to do another one of these before Sunday. Um, last time we read sort of like two scary stories in a row, um, which was fun. But part of me thinks it might be fun to do like more streams, but shorter stories potentially. I don't know. I'm still sort of messing around with the schedule and the format for this stuff. So I do want to know what you folks think. Like um, Shy Violet says, but, but, but spooky Sundays. I know, Sunday is a good day to do this, but, yeah, but maybe like a sort of midweek horror could be fun. Um, uh, Blinks241 uh, <laughs> sends a great gif of, what is that? Is that a, I feel like it's a pear, I feel like it's a, yeah, it's a pear. It's an it's a pair. It's an alive pair that's doing some weights and it says keep it up. For the video on demand people watching after that that's gonna make no sense at all. But just imagine this pair absolutely just 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 really going for it with the weights. David Battelotti says, Hold the rope as the master climbs into a cursed well, or other duties as required. Yeah, 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 I think so. Uh, Kay Collier says, before I forget, happy Mother's Day to all the mums. Yeah, happy Mother's Day, all the mums out there. Um, any mums watching? Yeah, they, um, uh, every single year, Mother's Day in the US, like, freaks me out, makes me jump, makes me think I've forgotten Mother's Day. Uh, because it's earlier in the year in the UK, we've already done it. We already did it. It's done. Um, yeah. Uh, and but I still I'm like oh my gosh I forgot oh no. Uh, Amory says thank you again I've come to look forward to these they're strangely gripping. Cool 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 cool. Um. Yeah. Best Bloomer says technically sinister Saturday also works weird Wednesday frightening Friday terrifying Tuesday. Woeful Wednesday. Suggest Dally Daydream. Um. Yeah yeah well. Anyway, I'll let you know. Let, let me think what would be a, when would be a good time. Um, Fran Fry says, cat parent? Does that count? Yeah, it does. If you've got a cat and you're a mother to that cat, sure that counts. Of course it counts. <laughs> Some great suggestions of days. Morbid Monday, Thrilling Thursday, Maniacal Monday, tra Traumatizing Thursday. I like Traumatizing Thursday. That's good. Thalmaturge Thursday suggests Alex H. That is strong. That is strong. Okay. All right. Well, um, here's as much of a plan as I have for the next streams. I don't have a, a plan very far in ahead. There's one more story that I've read in this collection of short stories that I am keen to read. It's quite short. Um, not super short, but like shorter than one we just read more along the length of the ones uh, of the ash tree and um canon albrick scrapbook which we did last week it's called oh whistle and i'll come to you my lad which is an amazing title um so how about um we'll do a stream at some point in the middle of the week and yeah 
will do a whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. Um, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to have a think about the, um, uh, I'll have to think, have a think about the day. Oh, wow, yeah, some, um, S-tier title, says Katie Douglas. Yeah, there's a, there's a few, few people in the chat who are saying that they've read, uh, a whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. Um, terrifying title, says Angela Sanchez. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a, a whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. Well, but yeah, it's a good story. It's a good story. So yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully see some of you, uh, or all of you, all, every single, if you're watching this now, I'm making eye contact with the webcam and I'm saying, I will see you next stream. Uh, I look forward to the pleasure of your company. Um, yeah, I think that'll be fun. John Burnham says the 60s BBC adaptation of that is brilliant. Ooh, I didn't know there was a... Okay, well, we'll read it. We'll read it. Let's stay spoiler-free until we read it on the stream. And um, and then we'll... Uh... Yeah, then we will... Um... Yeah, then we can go away and watch the BBC one. Uh, it is quite short, so maybe we'll do a couple next time. Um, a few people asking for the mezzotint, which is another... Another short story. Yeah, I think that one could be fun. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. This was a good time. I uh, hope you enjoyed this scary story, The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Fi final thing to say. I feel like there was a real gear shift in the plan of Abbot Thomas, where it's like, step one, cryptic clues in Latin, written... Uh, the, the. Step two, they must figure out the, the, the orders of the fingers is a cipher that lets you count the numbers, which leads to the location. Step three, they must have deciphered that you are looking for the eyes that went away. Step four, there's a Cthulhu in a hole. And I put a Cthulhu in there, and when you open the thing, no matter how clever you were with deciphering all the other steps, a little Cthulhu will get out and brush up against your face and freak you out and hang out outside your door and horrify you. I think... <laughs> I just think that was a... I just think that was a, an escalation. <sighs> true, true says, step five, question mark, question mark, question mark. Step six, profit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a, it's just an odd, it's just, a, it's just an odd plan. Uh, Mr. Team Corvette says, bam, surprise squid toad. Uh, ah, here's a question that a few of you are asking. Best Bloomer says, Luke, will there be a music stream this week? Yeah, I haven't done a music stream in a little while. Um, possibly, uh, possibly. I am trying to sort of balance my, um, uh, like, these streams with, you know, like, other stuff I'm up to. I'm trying to, like, write some music that hopefully I will be able to publish. So possibly there won't be a music stream um, this week. Uh, I'm just always trying to balance up what I think is entertaining people during lockdown versus, you know, trying to keep myself entertained during lockdown versus, like, getting as much stuff done as possible versus not losing my mind so that's yeah there's a kind of four-way struggle lucas petrie says no matter how well you do on the clues cthulhu hugs yep 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 yep, yep. no matter how well you do in the clues cthulhu hugs rebecca m says luke my buddy my pal we would literally watch luke does the gardening you would not watch luke does the gardening i can't do any gardening it's too hard the only gardening i can do is in animal crossing and i'm not even very good at that my lack of blue roses will attest one day one day i'll get them well uh i will let you all get on with your evenings uh slash days have a lovely sunday everyone uh what remains of it see you in the week uh keep an eye on uh my twitter i'll let you know where the next one is um that's uh twitter.com slash uh luke westaway all one word um and on instagram luke underscore westaway yeah, we'll do um, we'll do some scary midweek stories. I think that'll be fun. Everyone's saying they would watch me do the uh, incorrect gardening. Well, careful what you wish for. Maybe I'll do it. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good horror. See you next time. Bye. I mean, blue.